Brian had ticked, you know, in your head, he had ticked all those kind of boxes. <laughs> wow. So that's really how it, how it come to be, you know. Yeah, and, that's, that's great, because I haven't obviously heard that side of the story, and it was fascinating. <laughs> All right, everybody, thanks for joining me on what is uh, going to be pretty much uh, first in a series of flashback Let There Be Talks, the flashback episodes. A lot of people out there are just discovering the show over the last couple of years, but the show's been going on for over 12 years now, and there are tons of guests that people always recommend to me that have already been on. And uh, I thought it would probably be best to maybe put out one every Thursday and, you know, either let you relive it or hear it the first time. So today is a very special one since ACDC is out there and uh, about to tour again. Uh, For the record, Power Up, which came out back in 2020, you know, due to COVID, they couldn't tour. So now here they are out announced a tour new bass player uh new drummer and going through europe and i'm sure eventually be hitting the states i saw them a few months ago at the power trip festival out there in the coachella desert and uh you know it was something i didn't think i was ever going to see again but acdc is celebrating their 50 year anniversary right now in true acdc fashion They have kept the mystique. They have not said if this is a farewell tour. They're not even really calling it a 50 year anniversary tour. Although they did drop some merch today that finally had the 50 logo. So, oh, by the way, this is my Bon Scott sweatshirt in honor of uh, the great Bon Scott who we lost 44 years ago yesterday. So a lot of uh, ACDC history around this uh, episode. You can hear the way that Brian Johnson auditioned. You can hear how Brendan O'Brien produced the record back in 2020, how it was made secretly, how uh, Cliff Williams and Phil Rudd joined back up to do the record. There's a lot of good, good stuff here. And it was the only podcast that ACDC has ever done. So an absolute honor. You know, I could have ended the podcast after that. And if you haven't heard my Phil Rudd interview or cliff williams those are on there also today is brian and angus I recorded this episode about 2 30 in the morning because they were in australia and uh, i had to stay up <laughs> and and that was a weird thing during that time coming out of covid because i was kind of going to bed around eight o'clock with nothing to do so staying up till 2 30 was uh it was pretty easy though because i was so jacked on adrenaline Anyway, here's the episode. I hope you guys all enjoy it. In the meantime, I will be in Portland, Oregon tonight at the, where am I at? The Trailblazers Arena, whatever. I I think it might be called the, I can't remember what it's called. I'm dumb. Anyway, tonight, Portland, tomorrow night, Vancouver, and Saturday night, Salt Lake City with my man, Bill Burr. We're out there rocking and rolling, trying out the uh, local cuisine and enjoying life. I love all you guys. Check it out. Here it is from back in 2020, my ACDC conversation with Brian and Angus. Thanks for tuning in. All right. How are you guys? Thanks for joining me. This is a a pretty monumental day for me. I, uh, nine years ago, started a podcast. I wrote on the list of dream guests and you guys were at the top and here we are nine years later good to be yep. here dean good to be here my son it's funny because i i i'm a huge acdc fan i could see the headline acdc does massive fans podcast first podcast you guys have ever done right i think it is uh, yeah. yeah could be yes uh, <laughs> this is i'm not I, I've never seen a podcast. <laughs> I think it was in that, that movie. What was it? The night of the, what was the night of the, uh, 
<laughs> you know, the one where they all become pea pods or something. What was uh, that? The, uh, the, the, the night of, of the, uh, the visit is from Mars with two dicks <laughs> or something like that. Another one, you mean, either come with a pea pods. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, I'll, and I'll it, screamed. Yeah. <laughs> I got yeah. something to show you guys. Uh, a couple things. Uh, Angus, can you see me? You got, the, you got a screen there? You've got a great logo behind you. It looks fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Here's something cool I want to show you guys. I want to show you two things just to let you know where I'm coming from. And I took the logo off just for a minute. This is uh, 1978, and this is the first time I saw ACDC Oakland Coliseum Power Age Tour. Oh, and wow. That's really, yeah, that's something. That looks really yeah. good. Yeah. And the, yeah. the bill was Cheap Trick, ACDC, yeah. Journey, Blue Oyster Cult, Ted Nugent. Yeah. Good. That's All a right. good bill. That's a good bill. And those are, say, those are the same bands <laughs> I listen to to this day. Now, Brian, you're, you're going to love this one. Oh, this good. is the three of us, 1985, fly in the wall, Cow Palace backstage. <laughs> ah. Oh, at, oh, that is great, me son. Look at yeah. that. Now, that is uh, yeah. Brian with the Heineken, and he's wearing a Statue of Liberty shirt, giving the middle finger. <laughs> and, and Angus looks super happy to take the photo. <laughs> I'm brilliant on photos. <laughs> I, I, I got to tell you something about that that day. It was uh, what I would say exact to skydiving. They said, hey, the guys will take a quick photo with you. Hurry up. And I went in there, and it was like skydiving. I had skydived before, and it was just a, a burst of adrenaline. Zzz, and I don't even remember. You guys are like, all right, mate, have a good one. And I was like, what happened? And I got home and I had the photo. <laughs> I, uh, I, I yeah. call the podcast Let There Be Talk. But I think in the honor of Brian being here, it's going to be for those about to talk today. There we go. Oh, thank you. <laughs> It's an honor to have you guys on here. I, I want to uh, dig in a little bit on, uh, of course, uh, a, a long career that you've had, and it's been incredible, the whole ride. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about when you guys first got together, the, uh, the audition back, Brian, when you joined the band. I, I was wondering what was – I read recently that – you were going and you did a vacuum commercial, picked up a little money, and then went to do the audition. You know, people keep remembering that bastard. Yes. Uh, <laughs> it was, and I, I, uh, yes, it was on the way. I didn't have that much money, you see. And, uh, and when I was asked to go down, I had to try to, this guy had phoned and just, I've never done an advert before. Just an old guy from the past. And he said, if you come down, we'll pay you some money. I think it was 35 quid or something. And I said, oh, that should pay for the gas. <laughs> you know, down the road <laughs> and back. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, you know, and uh, we went down there. And I'll never forget, you know, I'd done the advert. And then I drove across London. Well, it wasn't very far to a place called Vanilla Studios. Is that right, Angus? Vanilla? Yeah, you're Studios. probably right. Something yeah. like that. Yeah. 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 And anyway, I got there and uh, I looked in and it looked the business, you know, guys with hair and beards and, you know, jeans and with holes in and everything. I said, this must be the place. And they were all playing pool downstairs. They were all playing pool. And the cut of my jib, you know, I wasn't dressed like anything except what I was, a working jaw from up north. I started playing pool with them, and it wasn't until the tour manager, a guy called Ian Jeffries, come down and said, has anybody seen that Geordie fella from Newcastle? With it? And I said, oh, oh, that's me. He said, they've been waiting for you for an hour upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck that. Angus, at, at, at what point in this audition... I always wondered this. How many guys had you looked at 
And uh, obviously you made the uh, incredible, uh, perfect choice, but were there other guys that came in? Was it a long audition process? That, like, did that guy from Crocus ever come in? People that were, you know, out there doing this? No, uh, we never got that guy. Uh, no, there, there were just various people. A lot of people, uh, you know, somebody might recommend somebody. And uh, so there was, you know, basically uh, at the time it was just Malcolm and myself, really, you know, we were there with, with our guitars and me and him had been writing uh, uh, songs and stuff. And, uh, you know, so it was just me and Malcolm strumming away there with guitars. And, uh, you know, if they'd say, oh, we get somebody to, to come in and try, you know. Uh, and then we would get, you know, we would just, you know, play away with the, with, with the two guitars, you know, and see how, how, it, how it would go. And yeah. uh, so, there was, yeah, there was quite a few different people, uh, you know, yeah, but um, I guess it was a, a case of, you know, who stood out, yeah? And uh, the funny thing is, is when he walked through the door, he, Brian stood out just the way he walked. <laughs> and, you, and you sat up and you, you, you paid attention, you know, you go, oh, yes, you know, and then he... Uh, you know, said hello, you know, how are you? And everything you, you want, you know, one of the guys get him a cup of, you know, whatever he wanted, if he wanted coffee or, or something, you know, and, uh, you know, and it was a case of, uh, you know, okay, do you, you know, what do you, do you know, do you know any songs by us? <laughs> uh, and he, I think he, he said, yeah, I, I know, uh, he knew Rosie because he, yeah, right. he'd been digging with a band and, uh, you know, and uh, you know they did a couple of songs, and they did Rosie, and uh, and I think I yeah. did. You know, I it was Highway to Hell. He knew too. I think yeah, uh, yeah. And then a few other ones, and I, and I think he, and, you know, and Mal, I think said you, you, you want to try something to be you know that you're comfortable with or something. Brian said, oh, I'll try. Uh, what about Nut Bush City, City Limits? <laughs> yeah. And off he went, and he, you know, he, here he was, and we, we were banging away on that, that, that tune. And, uh, you know, uh, and then he, uh, we, you know, we did, uh, you know, like uh, Rosie, we did Tribe Rosie with him, and yep. then uh, and Highway to Hell, you know. And he did, a, he, did a, he did a great job, you know. We asked if we, you know, asked him if we just put it on a tape, you know, so we had something, you yeah. And, uh, you know, he, and he said that, you know, and uh, he, he talked a little bit, you know, and I think he had a, a, a beer or two with Mal. You know? Yeah, we did. <laughs> he, was back, he was going back up north, you know. Yep. And Mal said, well, if you, you know, mind, we, if, if we get you down again at some point, you know, and, and, and see. I think it was about a week later or, or so, you know, uh, you know, Brian came down again. And we got, uh, we got him. And I think the lads, we got the rest of the guys. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, a couple of run-throughs. You know, and then it was again, you know, uh, uh, me and Mal uh, sat there. And, uh, you know, I think we tried him. You know, we were jamming on one of our uh, what, a couple of ideas that we, we were going to put down an album. And, uh, again, you know, it's... In tapes to see how it was, and uh, you know, and we just said, you know, just j scat away, just do whatever comes in your head if you think. And uh, so, you know, we were asking, you know, and uh, asking if he had a, a contract and everything. And did he, you know, and he was given info what he what he knew at the time. And then, uh, you know, and he was back, and and Mal said, well, well, we'll definitely let you know as soon as we, you know. What, what we what, what what we're gonna do? We'll get in contact with. Him. Anyhow, after he left, me and Mal were playing away, and uh, we had the idea, Mal's idea, doing the the, the back and black song. And uh, I had suggested to Mal, I you know, at the time I said uh, I had a piece that was an older piece that me and him had worked on, and I said, uh, what about if we if we took that piece? And we'd not used it before, and we and we try and hook that into that song, you know, for a good, you know, for a good singing thing. And I'll give you the uh, a singing line for help with Mal. And uh, he said, "Well, let's hear what you got, right?" So uh, 
we put that little uh, chord idea together and it, it was working. Mal would seem happy. And then he says, right, do your little singing, what you hear. And I, I was doing the, you know, well, the back and black and ah, 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 ah. And, I, and then after it, and as soon as I, it's, it's kind of went ah, 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 and then going up and up the scale, yeah, I said, you know, Mal, I said, uh, uh, Brian, uh, you know, uh, I said, he could hit those notes. Yeah? I said, it, you know, he could really hit those notes. And he looked at me and he went, I said, because that's, you know, you, you could hear it in his registers and what we had done. And I said, and he's got that edge on his voice. And then he went, hey, hey, you know. And I said, and Mutt, actually, Mutt Lang had also heard what, what we had. And, and Mutt also known, knew another producer guy who had said about Brian's voice, you know. And he said, oh, yeah, Brian's got that, that, that breezing thing down pat. He's got it very natural. Yeah? And, uh, and, and Mutt liked that, you know, we, we, we'd sing it, you know, in vocalist. And uh, what we thought of, and it was like Brian, it, Brian had ticked, you know, in your head, had ticked all those kind of boxes. And, uh, and Malcolm went, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he said, leave it with me. And he got a hold of uh, Brian. And he, he said, uh, yeah, you know, hey, you know, well, how would you like to come in and join us then, you know, talk to Brian. <laughs> wow. So that's really how it, how it come to be, you know. Yeah, and, that's, that's great because I haven't obviously heard that side of the story and it's fascinating. It's fascinating because I remember the phone call, Angus, from Malcolm and it was, uh, it was my dad's birthday up in Newcastle. <laughs> You know, and, uh, and I had bought me dad a bottle of whiskey for his birthday present. And I went home to my mom and dad's and there wasn't anybody there. You know, and I went, oh, flipping heck. It was about two in the afternoon or something, 2.30. And I went, oh, well, I said, I'll just leave it here. And then the phone rang because Malcolm had me mom's dad's number. And, uh, and it was, that was the phone call. And I said to Mal, I remember I said, hang on, are you sure this is not a hoax? <laughs> he says, no. I said, well, could you ring us back in 10 minutes just to make sure that I'm not dreaming this, you know? And he did, God bless him. And he went, now, uh, he says, you fancy coming to the Bahamas? We're making a record and all of this. And I said, well, yeah, yes. He said, I'll get your people to get in touch with you. Okay, he said, I'm off to watch the Grand National on the telly, which is a horse race, you yeah. know. I and I put the phone down and I looked and I was going, there's nobody here. So I opened <laughs> my father's crisp, my father's birthday present and I had a glass of whiskey <laughs> to celebrate. <laughs> that was, there wasn't well, we, anybody there to tell. It was, it was strange, you know. I got a question for you, Brian. You, when you go in to work on this stuff your of course your style's a little different in Jordy. how did you try a different a few different styles while you guys were working on the stuff in bahamas were you stepping up to the mic going how's this kind of character is this voice because it is a little more radical and more violent than say a Jordy record well i think that was down a mutt langa uh, and marlin ang recognizing that I could do a bit more than I thought I could do. You know, I was always constrained by the songs I'd sung before. You know, it was just what you did. And, and it was, I could get up there, but maybe it sounded a little too sweet. Maybe, maybe. And I think uh, uh, Mutt Langer, uh, who's brilliant vocal thing, you know, but he doesn't take any prisoners when it comes to that. You know, he wants... What he knows, the boys want, and uh, and and so he'd ask us. He'd say, "Could you, could you, get up there full voice?" And I'd go, "Well, geez, I give it a try. It's awful high, isn't it?" And he'd say, "Just try it." And of course, I did, and even and it even shocked me um, that I could do that uh, without pulling any tricks on the desk to make it. Because I knew one day you got to sing it. Oh my God! You, you know, yeah. You can't, you, you can't fiddle with it, you know. And uh, so, yes, I think it, through that album, it taught me that 
uh, uh, taught me a lot. It really taught me just about everything I know now about how to get the best out of yourself or, or listen to instruction, you know, and, uh, but it, and at the same time, you know, just enjoying the whole process, you know, because it's, it's nothing better than hearing, going, I didn't know I could do that, you know. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's crazy, but it's true. You've well, got to yeah. be pushed sometimes. You've got to be pushed right. to, sh- to show what you can do. You know, you, you, you can just lie back, you know. Plus, we had a couple of, couple of weeks, you know. That I remember with, with Mutt said, we'll get all the guys in the back. <laughs> And we'll get, you know, get there with the song ideas. And, uh, you know, that was even before we went to the Bahamas. And he said, and we'll get the, uh, you know, we'll get Brian there and, and get the whole, the whole band. And, uh, you know, we'll make sure we've got, uh, you know, uh, like he, Mutt always liked if he'd do a bit of pre-production. Yeah. So it's when we got to the Bahamas, we could get straight in, get the sounds and start work. So we, yeah. you know, we out a lot. You know, we got a lot of the ideas with the with the songs, and you know, just do arrangements and see and see. Try Brian out with how he was going to go, and so you know, it was a case of that. You know, yeah. so you know, we were pretty. We were we weren't. We were kind of like we had that pretty much together, and then it was a case of you know getting the rest. You know, getting lyric and stuff, making sure that when we when we got the to the Bahamas, it was a case of, uh, you know, the band could get upset, uh, get set up, not upset, but <laughs> uh, get set up. And meanwhile, when that's going on, you know, you know, we could get together, get Brian and, you know, get the lyric things all going. And uh, so, that, you, know, that, you know, we could get the, you know, the whole thing started. So, And then when we yeah. got there... So, you know, a lightning storm and all the power went out for three days. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no. Welcome to the Bahamas. <laughs> yeah. you, you know, I had to say this one as well. You know, some fantastic stuff happened. I, re- I remember, Angus, you and Mal w- weren't happy w- with the guitar sounds, you know, the amps and all that, the, the speakers. And I remember seeing something amazing because uh, they were trying to figure it and somehow you and Malcolm said, hang on, why don't we turn the speaker up against the wall? Now, I, 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 I don't know what exactly you're doing, but I remember seeing it, and I remember uh, it working, this great sound. You know, it was, I cannot remember the exact technical details, but it was little things like that that stick in my mind about that album, and Mutt yeah. Langer being real pleased that they got yeah. this fantastic sound. And it was you guys just saying, well, you know, let's try this. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Can you remember that, Ang? Uh, oh, That's well. right. Because he, when he first set up and we got the sound roll and we were doing the song back and black. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, when we heard it back, it sounded a little bit too too polite, you know, the sound. It sounded a little bit too clear. Ah, that was and it. Mal, and Mal had said... Uh, you know, and he listened. He said, eh, "It just doesn't have our, you know, we want that, you know, a little bit of grit in there." And so, you know, it was a case of, "Okay, let's get what we, you know, get get at the ACDC sound." And Mutt was always cool like that. He goes, "Well, you you know your sound, you know, because you you guys, you, you know, that's what when he ever heard us on stage, he goes, I, I, you know, I hear it, I know it.'" He goes, and, and Mutt was always good, you know. So Mal said, maybe if we try the, they blocked off one of his, like the stacks, and he did the same with mine. He put them in a different spot. And then he, he got his in, you know, with the guitars, make sure that, you know, it was getting the sound we, that we knew. And, uh, and then after that, it was a case of, uh, you know, all right, we were ready to go. Everyone get the drums, everyone all tuned in. And then get you know get started and lay that track down. So that was the first track we we, we laid down. You know? Wow, back so, in black, the first song, yeah. unreal, unreal. It, set, it was the track that set the pace for the album. Yeah, you know? and once we knew that, because we knew that was it. You know, even before we went, I when Mal got that idea, you know, it was one of those things that you 
you hear it and you go. And I set them out. That's first track that we get. To, yeah, because that set the pace. Anything we, that we did after those songs, like Shoot the Frill and all of that, had to stand up to the, that track for me and him. It, any song we put together, you know, that was the, what was the thing. It, and that's as we went along. And then it, it, that did set the pattern of that whole album. It set the pace. Yeah. Yeah. You guys, when you guys were in the studio and you're working on Back in Black, is it uh, a lyrical collaboration? Are all you guys writing the lyrics, or how is that working, Brian? Well, at the time, it was, you know, Malcolm and Angus always had title and basic idea about what the song should be about and, uh, you know, and uh, how it should go and all of that. And so... <laughs> You know, Angus, Malcolm, and uh, I think it was Malcolm used to come down with a cassette in, in the afternoon to me and just going, uh, hey, John, I listen, this one's called Shook Me All Night Long, you know. You know, just, you know, see what you can come up with, you know. And basically, and if we went up there, the boys would say, well, you know, we can change this, you know, that's a bit soft. You know, uh, you know, keep it hard and, and all of that. And it, it worked great. I remember once, I, I was about the fifth song in, and I think it was uh, Hell's Bells. I'm not sure. But I, I remember, you know, because it had been a f frenzy of writing and all that. It was real work, 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 you know. And I was sitting in my little cubicle thing, and it was a horrible day. It was getting horrible outside. Mud come down. He says, he all right? I said... I think my brain's turned to mush. I said, I can't think of a thing. I said, <laughs> now, and the lads have got this song called Hell's Bells. You know, and I went, Whoa, I, I, I said, uh, and, and just then, honestly, for the first time, uh, uh, the, the first four lines of that is basically a weather report. I guess, you know, <laughs> what's in, and that big storm came through. And I was looking, I'm going, Hell's Bells. And, 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 and Mutt came down and he said, Oh, it's all right, just relax, it'll come. And he said, And anyway, they, it, you know, he said, you know, listen to that. And there was this, you know, the, like uh, only the Bahamas can have those big black clouds coming in. And, uh, and he says, uh, I, I says, it, it much can, that's rolling thunder, that is. <laughs> oh, man. So, and, uh, and then the rain came down and then the lightning and, and all of this. And it, that just all made sense, you know. And that turned out to be a cracker, that one, you know. Oh, my God, to say the least. It's, it's one of the most incredible ACDC songs of all time and an album opening smasher. I mean, yeah. just to see, I was at the Back in Black tour at the Cow Palace, and, you know, this is pre-internet. This is pre-cell phones. This is pre-YouTube. We're Here we are. We're in the room. The lights go out. Nantucket's done playing. Here comes ACDC. The bell comes down, the riff comes in, and the vocal comes out of the speakers, and it is insane. I never forgot it to this day. Like one of the most incredible performance, vocal performances I've ever heard. Cheers, me. Who, who, who was it? <laughs> <laughs> here's, here's something amazing about Back in Black is this, this record is so unbelievable and everything that happened the songwriting the production mutt lang the vocals all of that but then the record company seemed to really step it up for you guys and this is like really next level stuff that they were doing because who knew i mean here's a new singer that's never been done before and now they're promoting the hell out of this record they're going for it man they must have known this is a smasher yeah we 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 were pretty lucky at at that time you know um, at first it is a, it's, it's a hard thing to do because as you say you know it's the, the you know you know i mean record companies are you know you, 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 they've also got a business side to them so they yeah, a lot of them kind of go uh, well, is this really going to happen? How many bands, you know, can, can do that? And uh, but I think it's when they, 
when they heard the the quality of the, of the album, they heard the song and whatever, and I I think that really give you know uh, you know uh, you know put the seal on it, you know, and they said, and, yeah. and, and they said, and you know, listen to the the vocal and everything and what they've done, and any and and I guess their feedback from people within their going it's uh, it, it, it's a, a you know a cracking album and. Uh, so I think it's, they got excited about it, you know, and uh, that's, you know, uh, I think half the, half the thing that push, helped push it along, you know. So it was good in that sense, and we got everything what we, you know, we had said, you know, we, I, because it was even quite tough, you know, we wanted a, a, an album cover, you know, uh, you know, we wanted it all in black because of, uh, you know, the death of Bond. So it was our tribute to, to Bob. So that was, you know, because they also when you know, people go, what, why, why would, you know, you get people going, why do they want to have a, a, a morning, you know, because black being the, you know, the yeah. morning, you know, what you do, you know, for funerals and things. Why do they want that? But that was our way. And we, we, we just wanted a plain cover bag in black. And as Malcolm said, and it, 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 it it was also a, a, a thing of uh, what does the cover really mean? It's what's inside really matters, you know. You know, so the whole the whole project, you know, it, it was really good when the, when they got it and they, and they said, okay, you know, we we're going to give it you know, a best, you know, a good shove. And we were lucky also too because a lot of radio guys out there they would hear it, you know, and a lot of syndicated radio were going. If I put the, when I put these guys on radio, the, the, you know the you know all the phones light up. That's how how much the, you know a lot a lot of people were uh, you know plugged into that album. So that it was just that initial strong feedback. I think they said, "Well, we you know, we we got to push this." Yeah. It's unreal. It's unreal. I mean, you guys go and do like five videos. Brian can also tell you too. We were touring on that album. We had to tour. This, yeah. uh, and uh, we we were playing, you know, all over the, the, the U.S. doing a lot of dates, and and for and for us as a band, it really after we had finished touring, and then we had stopped touring, uh, and I remember being at home, and uh, you know, uh, the the next the, it was really the next year. Uh, our, you know, we we were getting ready. We were going to actually be performing in Australia here, and uh, and I remember uh, our tour manager. He come and he was there early, and I remember talking to him. And he he said to, to us at the time. He said, uh, uh, "Do you know? He goes, you 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 guys have uh, you know." You've just uh, sold a million and a half albums, right? And I said, "Well, that's a lot of albums." <laughs> you know, that was a big thing. I thought, "Hey, we we've sold uh, you know a, a million and a half albums." I really thought, "Great." And he said, "No." He said, "What you don't understand, Angus?" He said, "That's just in LA alone. That's Whoa. LA alone." He said, "That's not the rest of the country. That's LA." He said, "Imagine what's coming in the rest of the country." No, that's it, insane. Yeah. I couldn't believe it, you know. No. I mean, this thing <laughs> is—it's an animal. I mean, that, uh, I, I mean, I know you have a new record out, but I, 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 I cannot ignore the second biggest record of all time. This thing is—it's—it's it's unreal. It is a, uh, it is, it is incredible what you guys have created i gotta to remember too it's a rock album it's a hard rock album uh, so you know you you're you're getting across to a you know a, a, a big audience you know you, you're crossing a lot of what would normally yeah. not i mean uh, the, the, the people who were managing us uh, uh, i remember uh, david krebs you know he he was part of this management Lieber and krebs and, uh, and and David Krebs said had always said to me, any rock band will only sell X amount of you know a couple of million records tops. You know, you, that's all they do. 
He goes, whether it be this or this band or that, you know, nobody gets past them, you know. And uh, he, he was shocked, you know, that we went above that, those numbers. Uh, well, yeah, so, because at the time you'd think there's probably only like two million rock fans or something. And, yeah. and for a record to be really huge, let's say like the Eagles' greatest hits or the Michael Jackson thriller, uh, that's kind of like all kinds of people listen to that type of music where rock is a category. This is, this is the group of people, but this thing, it grabbed everyone. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I think that that was what, you know, uh, was really a big, you know, a big turnaround for a, for a lot of people. Yeah. Let me ask you this, Brian. What, now you're out on tour. ACDC, of course, was used to, non-stop touring all the way up to highway to hell they just worked their asses off and now you're out there and you've got to sing uh have a drink on me and hell's bells and shoot the thrill that are at the complete highest ever at what point you're doing a ton of dates do you just go like wow man i am trashed i mean it's got to be brutal on you you know it was uh, you know it was very dope. Well, it certainly took it out here yeah, because there's not much breathing space in there. But you know what? Uh, when you're rocking with a band and all of that, and you know, and the great thing is with a record, I'd always, you, you know, as, as a matter of habit, before I did gig, I'd play the album to make sure that, that I wasn't wandering. You know, sometimes you get lazy and you wander from the original things, and I'd always put it on and make sure that I was on the money with the things. And once you, you, and it, you can hear yourself doing it, you just go, and it, it's, it's strange. You know, you go on and do yourself, if you know what I mean. You, yeah. You, you, know, you want to do, you do yourself, so it's, it's bang on. And, you know, it's like Angus was saying, that, you know, with, a, with, with, with the, the radio guys and all that. And uh, one of the things that, one of the most exciting nights of my life, I was sitting with, I, I think Marlon Clip, I think we were playing cards, I, I cannot remember, in a hotel room, and we just heard, Hi, this is Wolfman Jack, and I'm going to play something now that's going to change your life. ACDC back in black coming from Wolfman Jack. I'll never forget it. And it came on and we went, fuck. Uh, and it... Uh, it and it was those kind of people that just put this mystery and fucking sparkly shit on this uh, on, on on this record, and it was. Uh, but you got to remember, I think it was the record itself that was the magic, not all the shit that went on around it. It was this this missile of a of a record that came out and just I get you know it's just, it just an experience applicable really apart from the great songs i mean that, that's easy to figure that one out but why those particular 10 songs at that particular time you know that's the big uh, you know and the sequence <laughs> i can't figure it out <laughs> I, I, I mean those are things you don't try to figure out you just go no. oh the magic was here and it was 100 percent chemistry yeah. and lightning in a bottle Let's get into a little bit about the next record here, which I think is uh, another masterpiece. And, and I think for those about to rock, is, uh, it's an unbelievable record. It's a totally different record. And <coughs> I, I could say it was probably my favorite out of the Brian era. I know that I read uh, quite a bit that you guys uh, went and did it, I guess, in Paris in a warehouse or something. And Malcolm wasn't very happy with uh, Mutt taking a long, long time. Mutt had started to change his production style of really going long. Am I correct? It was a case of, um, you know, we, we had started uh, originally, we, we were in, uh, uh, in Paris, in France, and, uh, you know, there was a studio there that, uh, you know, you know, we had gone there, but then, you know, it, it was, you know, a, a big studio, a well-known studio. But when Mutt, when we got there, there was a lot of things. Mutt really was searching. He wanted, a, you know, really, you know, uh, you know the, the, especially a drum sound. He really wanted this, you know, a unit, you know, uh, uh, 
you know, something that brought life to the, to the, to the drums naturally, you know, that had, gave a good ambience. You know. So we, we were there in, in one studio and we tried, you know, and it wasn't really coming, the, the sound that he wanted, you know, and he tried various setups, different setups. And he still, and he tried different approaches. And then he said, and he was finding out, you know, uh, where did other people try their, 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 you know, their setup with drums and that? And somebody said, oh, you know, <laughs> he, somebody, you know, they actually went out even into the reception area and took those people out and put drums and whatnot. <laughs> and he thought, well, you know, uh, he wouldn't. I'm going to go check out a few stu other studios. You know? And uh, so he went around uh, various other ones and he would try different setups with the drums. And then he would get Malcolm and myself and go, oh, come and have a listen. And then, he, you know, we'd be in one way. And he still, he goes, yeah, this is better, but it's not, not what I'm hearing. And he said, you know what? You know, because we had been re in this big rehearsal room uh, where we'd been doing pre-production with, with him. And he said, you know, in there we were getting this really great live drum sound, natural uh, sound. And he said, why don't we, you know, why, what about if we do this? We get, uh, you know, uh, we get that Stones mobile, the, the, you know, the mobile uh, uh, bus thing that they had, or which was a recording studio on wheels. We'll get that here. And then uh, we'll just set up in that big warehouse. So that was where, where, where we, uh, we ended up setting, setting up. And, uh, and, and he thought great because he could put the drums, you know, where he thought the drums were, you know, were happening the best. He could, you know, with the guitars, he could do anything because it was that much space, you know. You can put the guitars anywhere, you know, where it was going to uh, come to life, you know. Yeah. He even had his even set up, you know, how we would live, you know, like with the, with, with the amps and that, just to see if that was even going to be you know, something unique. So he tried different setups. Uh, then once we, he was happy with what, you know, with what he was hearing, it was a case of, okay, we, you know, get bound to uh, the, the fact of start recording the songs, so, you know. But it was, it was, that took a little while, you know, moving back and round and, and trying yeah. to find. And uh, so that was really what was kind of uh, delay, uh, delaying it a bit. Yeah. And as, and as you want, and probably because it's, you know, it not being a fully recording, as you would normally know, you know, you could be taking a lot longer trying to get certain things the way sound and as ha how it should. So, you know, it, it would take a lot longer in that part. So th that was becoming a little bit, uh, you know, with us, I guess, you know. What we didn't want was the band getting burnt out where we keep playing the same song until it becomes sort of too tired. He didn't want to lose the energy of it. And that was what, you, you, and you didn't want fatigues to set in. You wanted, you know, when you're playing it, you wanted to sound fresh and exciting. So that was what Malcolm we really was, you know, he didn't want the, you know, the band to sound like, a, you know, um, uh, you know, like, you know, you're getting into a kind of a burnout, you know. Okay, I got it. Yeah. Brian, I, I think that uh, this record, you, you really shine again on it. Uh, uh, the amazing thing about ACDC, I've always said, is a lot like the Rolling Stones. You have so many songs that have never been played live. And it's crazy to think about. You have albums and albums and albums of these songs that have never, ever been played live. And a couple of them, boy, I, like Spellbound, I think, is one of the great, great, great ACDC songs. Yeah. I, I, I love that song. It, it's, the, it's one of the most fabulous problems you can have, you know, having too many songs. <laughs> you know, it's usually that way around for a lot of bands, you know. Uh, it, it's unanswerable. You know, you'd, you'd like to play them, you'd like to do that, but, you know, you've got to remember that people want to hear, the, the, you know, the, the songs that the stand, you know, the big standout ones or the hits or, or whatever, and... Uh, and, and there's just no room to fit them in unless you did a week 
and you had five different sets. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. It would be pretty tough. <laughs> I get it. I, I do a, a, I do a ACDC tribute once a year with uh, a lot of rock stars in L.A. And, and comedians, Bill Burr and Mark Maron. And we, we do this big ACDC tribute. And we, we, you know, this year I was like, well, we got to do uh, Soul Stripper. And uh, let's do, yeah. I sit next to you and, and, you know, you whip them out. And, and the crowd's like, and they're like, hey, man, these are some of the great ones. Listen up, you know. <laughs> it's like, I get it. I get it. I understand yeah. it. If you think of it, I remember, look, when we, even when we were back in black, I think one of the, the I remember we were going to Detroit and we were in Detroit. Were they even on yeah. that back and tour? Oh, no, no, sorry. When we were coming to do, after we were coming to do, when we were touring for those about the rock. I remember the opening night, we were on stage playing for nearly three, three and three quarter hour. Look, Brian's up there on Vogel. That is <laughs> any strain for anyone going what he was doing. And, and we're going for all the hard ones, you know. The, <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's, we, we come off, off stage, we think, oh, we've only been on three and a half minutes. Right? <laughs> People are going, you've been on three hours, 45, you know, 45 minutes tonight, you know. Oh, yeah. When you put together when you put together the uh, set list, was there any songs that you wouldn't touch, Brian or Angus, that you didn't want to do? That was like a an, uh, a Bond era. Like I noticed that Livewire went away. Of course, that was always a great opener. Brian will tell you any every song we ever done, Back and in Black included. For those about the rock and there, we went through in rehearsals. We did all those tracks. We were prepared for any of those tracks to come up and, and play. We would have to go on and go, we know we have to play this one. We know we have to play that one. We know we have to play this one. We, we know we have to play those tracks. And you were saying before, like, Stones, you know. Well, if I went to see the Stones, I've got a wish list. <laughs> and I go, I want to hear the Stones too. Honky Tonk Woman. I want to hear them do Jumping Jack Pass. I want to hear Street Fighting Man. I want, all the, I want them to play all my favourites. You see what right. I mean? And that's what happens with us. We have all those, those tracks and we don't. We go out there and we go, we know this is, these are big songs that we got, we, we got to play. And then on that, we got to go, okay, maybe we can colour it up a bit and bring in something a little bit different. This is where it ends up. How long can we sustain it on stage? We, we, we never wanted to get on and, and go, uh, you know, uh, they, they, these guys are, uh, you, know, you know, getting up there and we're not peaking. For us as a band, we, that was always our thing. We always went, we always went, and we wanted to go on at this strength and we wanted to go like that. That's it. I, I know that uh, Phil is back and you had Simon Wright and you had Chris Slade. Um, yeah. it, it's funny because Phil is the secret weapon of ACDC. When he gets, yeah. in, when he gets behind that <laughs> kit, it's yeah. on. You can talk to the greatest drummers on the planet. I've interviewed most of them on this show and all of them will be like, oh yeah, Phil Rudd. You think... He's doing nothing. And then you go to play an ACDC tune at a, at a jam or something, and they go, ah, oh, I don't know yeah. what I'm doing. And these are giant top pro guys. Phil, is a, a, he's, he has a unique gift. It's a natural thing that he put it this way. When I first time ever Phil got behind the drums and played, I said to Mal, when that guy starts driving, you know, when he starts driving and you're doing a guitar solo, man, I've got to play harder. I have to right. lift the game. I have to, to, to really belt into it, I go, because I ain't going to be heard once he starts cracking that. Yeah? <laughs> he, he's, got a, <laughs> he's got a unique drive, you yeah? <laughs> uh, uh, know? Nice. And I... He just seems to have a natural thing. He, he, you know, he says he looks at my little legs going, and he goes, "I know when to, what you're going to do." You know, <laughs> <laughs> he is unreal. Uh, he is the secret sauce. Yeah, he's he's great. Yeah, I was, you know, he, he said to me, young uh, uh, Dean, uh, he, he, once he said, "Ah, John, you know," he said that. Uh, 
And he said, yeah, you've got to watch out for them dental drummers. And I said, what's a dental drummer? He said, ah, you know, the kind, they see a hole, they'll fill it. <laughs> 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 you know, because his whole thing is just keeping a beat my ass. Uh, he, you know, I don't know what it is. He hits the beat. Uh, you think he's going to fall off the stool before it just hits it right where it's supposed to swing, you know, or roll, whatever you want to call it. And he's fucking, it's just natural. And, and, and it gets you every time, you know, you, you know, he's, he's, he's great. And, and uh, we love him. He's, yeah, he's I get fit, it. he's you know, healthy. You know, when I've known him, you know, going way back from, you know, the early years and all, all the way through. And I mean, he, he, he it's, it is that it's just, that he's, he's so natural. Let's talk a little bit about, of course, you guys, uh, you've been doing this all your life and, uh, I've had a lot of, a lot of uh, guys on. I had Paul Stanley on and uh, recently, and he was talking about two hip replacements and stuff like that. I watched you, Angus, my entire life since 1978, jumping from three stacks of marshals, landing on your knees, uh, full tilt head bobbing the entire time. I mean, doing, doing the circle on it. What, what is your body like right now at your age have, have yeah. you had any uh surgeries or anything no none, none whatsoever you know i mean i've been i've been on stage i might do the odd bruise and ankle uh uh you know you know do the damage to my i used to use lose a lot of my 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 nails on my my feet they used to go first you know because i don't know the wear and tear they would I was guaranteed every tour I would, you know, I, at least three, three or four times during the tour, I would, you know, lose a toenail or two, you know. So that was always expected. But I've been pretty, pretty lucky. I, you know, I've even gone through stages when in my early years, you know, because some of them, you know, like you had to use what the, the stage was in the building. And sometimes, you know, you, you know, some buildings used to give you A, they had an A stage and a B stage, you know. <laughs> <Woo -wee>. <laughs> you would get it. They go, I, yeah, I could always tell when we got the B stage because, you know, I could guarantee my feet were going to go through them. <laughs> yeah, I'm lucky. I, I've been pretty lucky, you know. I might get the odd. I think I, the worst I ever got was, a, 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 a you know, a, a thing with my finger one time. I had a splint. That lasted. I got on stage. I did that, that lasted all of a second. That, that came off in the first thing, and I still had to play with the, with the fractured finger. So I was pretty – I got through that, you know. How about you, Brian? How are, how are you doing? Uh, well, uh, you know, I've, I've been lucky. I've never spent a, a night in hospital in my life, uh, touch wood. And, um, you know, it's uh, apart from – you know, the, the obvious was when my ears went and all that, but that's invisible, so thank God for that. But uh, other than that, honestly, I've been as lucky as Angus in a way, you know, we should have been hurt, me and Angus, many times, you know, uh, with wandering cameramen and booms and, you know, and big black holes in front of you and stuff like that. But we were always uh, very lucky. I, I, uh, I know you, you don't want to get really into the, uh, the hearing thing and stuff like that, but I, uh, I'm so happy that you're back singing in this band and it, it, it gives me oh, goosebumps. I, I, I'll tell you guys a funny story. I heard the record back in March. Mm. I was called down to Sony. They said, uh, yeah, who do you know then? <laughs> nobody had heard the record. And they said, we want to get ACDC on the podcast. We know you're a monster fan and we know you've been doing this nine years and it's your dream guest. We want to do this. Come down. So no. I signed a, an NDA, a secret clause. It's just me in a room. No one in there. A bottle of water. They turned it on. And I was losing my mind. And then for the next seven months, I had to walk around like I didn't know anything. Listen to yeah, Join the club. <laughs> I, I know. Right? Join the club. Oh. Uh, it was that's awful. They give me non-disclosure all the time. Here you go. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Oh, dear me. Yeah, it, well, I, we'd be walking around for, 
Mom's thinking, so man, what's happening, man? I hear the, you know, there's photographs on the thing, man. And like, you know, come on, you can tell me. I don't know <laughs> what you're talking about. Oh, come on, man. And he goes, I don't know what you're talking about. Honestly, it's just, and then later they're going to foot, you lying bastard, you fucking dumb. Well, you know what was funny was like about a month ago, I was like, well, you know, COVID, maybe it's, it's, maybe it's not coming out now. Maybe I'll just, fuck it. I'll just go on and do a whole episode about how I heard this. <laughs> And I said, eh, I better wait a little while. I don't want to blow this. And a week later, they called me and said, all right, it's on. And uh, so don't talk about it. It's going to happen. And I was like, oh, my God. And I was just losing my mind. But funny to listen to it. I, I felt like a kid when I went and bought Back in Black. I remember I rode the bus for an hour, went to Tower Records, got that Back in Black and got home. This was the same. I drove across L.A. in traffic, parked, went upstairs, sat down, and they go, are you ready? And I go, Oh, absolutely. And they go, do you just want to hear a couple songs? They go, what are you out of your mind? <laughs> you know? <laughs> so they kicked it on and, uh, and real eyes came on and I was like, wow, this is killer. But by the time we get to the crown jewel of this record, demon fire, I'm like demon fire and witches spell. I'm like, Oh, Oh, here, here is some serious rocking going on right here. I mean, what a, what a couple tunes back to back right there. When I first heard it, just like you did, uh, I think I, I sent off a communique to Angus. <laughs> and I said, hey, Mitt, I said, I got to tell you, I mean, this album, I'm going to listen to it straight away again. He said, but all I, I got to say is that I'm, I'm happy I'm not the guy that's got to pick a single from this because I am. I'm confused. They're, they're all you know, they're all eligible, you know? Let's talk yeah. about Through the Mist of Time. That's got to be the most, um, the most different song ACDC has ever done. Is this, did Brendan have a hand in this? Because it does kind of have a, uh, it's almost kind of an Americana Springsteen kind of vibe. This is totally different for ACDC. Yeah, well, somebody, somebody also commented, it's like a stax or something, you know, like from that. The ideas, you know, the song ideas were like, like with Mal and myself. And, uh, and it was just at the time, you know, when you're doing something, you know, we would play a track and then you would do something. And when you would play back a few tracks in a row and you would go, something stands out. And when you got a few ideas and you run them fast and, and that one jumped out at you. So for some reason you go, it jumps out and you go, it's a little bit different, but it's still you know, and as Malcolm always said, you know, by the time we finish with it, it is ACDC. So that's how we, you know, it, it, it always was the way we work. We always, you would listen to them, but the ones that jumped out, you go, I, there's, there, there's a bit of magic there. That's, that's got ACDC written all over it. So a lot of the, the ideas and a lot of these, these songs, they came from a, when we, we're going to do the album Black Eyes. Malcolm and me had a lot of years where the two of us had just been in, you know, a little studio, just working away all the time, just writing songs. And in that period, with so much stuff, you know, when we even when we went to do Black Eyes, it was a case of you know you got a, a few boxes of your, your ideas, and it was a case of. Uh, we only got even the, the box one, and we were just pulling out the first CDs and stuff that we had of, of, of tracks, yeah. And we were putting on, and it's a case of we, we, you know, when we were sitting down with Brendan, and Brendan's going, I like that, I like that, and that was just the first CD, I like that. And we never, you know, by the time you got that, you got like 20 ideas, you know, that he, he's already got, and then we go, you know. Even when we were doing it, I think we got to a, we were putting down tracks for, for Black Eyes, you know, and it, and it's like it comes to some point, you know. Brendan goes, well, you know, you, you're more than covered. You've got enough for a great album here. And I was even saying to Mal, hey, you know, we we're rolling here. Should we just continue and do do some more? And uh, you know, and Mal said, no, we you know, we'll get them later. Don't worry, we'll get them, you know, nothing because he's always said nothing goes to waste with us, you know. We, you know, if we got a good idea, it, we're going to use it. Yeah. Mm. So basically, that's really what, what, what I had when I, you know, I had to go through all of this uh, material. 
And, uh, you know, and for me, it, it, I mean, going through, it, it's a lot easier tasks, as I said, because of that time, you know, we had marked out all what were the ACDC, the ones that really stood out. <laughs> So, you know, and I've still got a lot of uh, those ideas, you know. So I'm, 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 I'm still not done with all what I, what I have, yeah. Well, there might be another one that you're saying, huh? I, yeah, I, I've got, and maybe I don't know how many of it that I would have. <laughs> wow. All right, I know you got to get out of here. I cannot thank you enough for doing this. It's, uh, it's pretty monumental to me. I mean, you don't understand no. what your band has done to my life is it is uh i have bonded over some of the greatest friends uh right. over your music i have had some of the greatest memories at your concerts hands down some of the greatest live rock i've ever seen i've seen over two thousand shows and i'm telling you you guys are uh lifers in my blood and everything about you guys I love. And I can't thank you enough for doing this show. It, it means so oh, much to me. Uh, thank That's an you. absolute pleasure and honor. Thank you. Brian, real well, quick. You, Dean. I'm a big watch guy. Brian, what are you wearing today? Oh, uh, this is a Graham. Uh, a Graham. I know Graham out of uh, England, London. Yeah, well, this is, this is for the 1944 D-Day landings. Oh, uh, the American... Uh, wow. uh, from the Second it's World War, <laughs> so that's 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 it's a it's a you know it's a celebrate. Well, it's not a celebration. It just it oh. it, it is for. It's called the Overlord Special. You know, after the Overlord uh, op op operation, a day day. So anyway, it's Angus. Fine. <laughs> Angus I'm a bit one. of a history buff. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Angus, I got one question for you. I know yes. you've got an army of SGs. My favorite one is the back and black one with the white pick guard. Uh, hey, yeah. What SG, if they were all gone, which one would you have to have? It, would it be vintage or is it a newer one? It's a, a vintage one. The, the one that I've always had and been on nearly every, well, every album I've ever done is a guitar that... Uh, now I, you know, because it's been on so many, you know, ACDC songs, I just save it for the studio now and I keep it, I, you know, I keep it away, you know. I don't want it because it, over the years when I used to use it live, you know, it got so many bumps and cracks and, and I, I got to the point where I just thought, I, I don't want it damaged anymore. I want to make sure, preserve it that... Uh, you know that it's it's there for when I'm doing you know studio stuff you know, and uh, and it, I've got it, when I've got that guitar I you, you know it's it's Ooh. so reliable you know I I just have to put it in and plug it in and yeah. I can get all my guitars line them up and I can go through them all and go and go in and you put them in everyone will go yeah that's a great sound that's a good sound but ang that one is <laughs> good sound that's the one you know. Wow. Just, <laughs> it's just got its own thing to it, yeah. and I don't know. I don't know why or nothing, you know. And it's funny, you know, because uh, Malcolm, my brother, was the one that said to me, and when I was younger, uh, he said to me, "Hang, there's this little shop not far," and he said, uh, "You know, they got a, you know, they got quite a few good guitars. They got a few Les Pauls and whatnot." <laughs> He said, but they got this great SG in there. And he knew I was looking for one, you know. And so, you know, I went down the shop. And I picked, you know, I tried and went through the other ones. When I got to that SG and I played it, went through the other ones. I came back, I played it, and it was like uh, I just went, this one. It, you know, I, it just it played so well. I didn't even have to think about it or, you know, it, and nowadays, it almost does play itself. You know, I, I, I can put it, when I put it on, I, it makes, if I'm playing, it makes my, you know, it just does its own, it's got its own thing, you know. Yeah. I love you guys, man. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, thanks, Dean, me, son. 
I could talk I'll to you guys for 20 hours, man. And hopefully <laughs> one day I'll get to backstage, <laughs> chew your ear off to where you go, get this fucking guy away from me. <laughs> Never. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thanks, it's a Steve. pleasure, me, son. Congrats on that later. new record, man. I cannot wait to see you guys out on the stage again. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. See ya.